I'd like to welcome two special distinguished guests here among us. And I dedicate what I say today for them. Uh, the Honorable Sayyid Sadruddin al Sadr, the first son of Imam Musa Sadr, who's sitting here. And he uh, arrived freshly from Beirut, Lebanon. And his brother Sayyid Hamid al Sadr. I welcome them here. Sayyid Sadruddin, I just told him before we started that if I remove my turban and put it on his head, people would think that his father is among us. He resembles his father 100% in his character and in his piety and wholesomeness. <clears throat> the title of my paper is <clears throat> Imam Musa Sad's political and social impact on the Lebanese Shia. Reason for his success. Where did he succeed where others failed? A man of a grand stature, rising nearly six and a half feet, and a face as some described Christ-like, humbly rose as a savior of the previous and forgotten Shias of Lebanon in 1969. Several key elements played a part to Imam Musa Sadr's famed 19th, 19 year rise in Lebanon. Lebanon is a heterogeneous society composed of a numerous ethnic, religious, and kinship groups, which made it more receptive to cultural differences and prospective adaptation. In a breeded with the utmost charismatic akhlaq, best of manners, and backed by a distinguished religious family name, he was easily accepted and liked by the Lebanese. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr was a visionary man, a charismatic preacher, a highly intelligent. He saw the plight of the Lebanese Shia and became passionate to awaken, reform, and strengthen them socially and politically. The story of Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr began some 700 years before his birth. In 1305, Imam, Imam Sadr's forefathers began the fourth wave exodus of Tyre, Lebanon because of an ethnic cleansing fatwa issued by Ibn Taymiyyah. And most of you are familiar with this name, Ibn Taymiyyah, Ahmed Ibn Abdul Halim Ibn Taymiyyah. He was the pioneer of uh, religious intolerance in Islam 700 years ago. And he has a thesis, uh, the title of his thesis is Jawazu Qital al Rafidah, the necessity of uh, fighting and exterminating the Rafidah, uh, referring to the Shia. Ibn Taymiyyah issued a fatwa that allowed for the spilling of the Shia blood to be permitted. Other Sadruddin relatives dispersed, some headed towards India, Iran, and Hejaz, the Arabian Peninsula. Many years later, Sayyid Musa's father, Sayyid Sadruddin al Sadr, and his uncle settled in Iraq, where they all attained the degree of ijtihad, and that is the highest level of <clears throat> religious learning. At the height of his father's popularity and having reached the level of an ayatollah, his father moved to Iran by the sought after request of Ayatollah al Ha'iri to co charge the Qum Seminary, the Hausa or the seminary in Qum. It was in Iran that the seeds of a reformer and the leader sprung from the footsteps of his father. Imam Sayyid Musa was born in the spring of 1928, almost eight years ago in the city of Qum, to a highly illustrious scholarly family. Embedded, surrounded, and raised within the shadow of his father, he absorbed the true spirit of a wise yet humble leader. To say the least, his father was extraordinary. Unlike other clerics, he lived within the people. He interacted with them. 
assisted them religiously, morally, and socially. In Qum, Ayatollah Sayyid Sadr al-Din al-Sadr, the father of Sayyid Musa, displayed some of his earnest traits, his humility and direction of life, the hereafter, rarely can it be seen amongst the grand ayatollahs to offer their post to another ayatollah. But this is what he did. <coughs> the father of Imam Sadr, this is what he did. When Ayatollah Burujurdi moved, one of the grand Shia leaders, he moved to the Qum Seminary, Ayatollah Sadruddin al-Sadr, the father of Imam Sadr, reiterated what the Holy Quran says about the pious. Tilka darul akhirah, naj'aluha lilladheena la yuriduna uluwan fil ardi wa la fasada wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. That house of the hereafter we shall give to those who intend no high handedness or mischief on earth. And the end is best for the righteous. He gave his position, his place to another ayatollah and saying that my place and my aspiration is not this life. I am aspiring the hereafter. Imam Musa Sadr experienced the political gears by watching his father's intervention. The Qum Seminary was a resistant institution under the collar eye of the Shah. The Shah despised the religious seminary and did his best to obstruct its operation. He antagonized the students, often arresting them and enforced military, military enlistment. While some scholars stayed from any form of political interference, Sayyid Sadruddin al-Sadr was one scholar who did not shy away. Perpetually, he in inspirited the students with the moral duty and the right to struggle for their religious education. Sayyid Sadruddin was no spectator when two nationalist movements attempted to oust the Shah in Iran. In 1951, the late Prime Minister Muhammad Musaddiq and later Sayyid Nawab Safawi, leader of Fidayan Islam, the devotees of Islam, made overthrowing attempts against the monarchy in Iran. And Sayyid Sadruddin al-Sadr openly ventured to support the political move. All along, Sayyid Musa al-Sadr, his son, had a front row view of how involvement in politics can bring about social reform. Then here I move to his education, how Sayyid Musa Sadr started his uh, uh, knowledge journey and education journey. After having completed his secondary and primary schooling in Qum, Sayyid Musa Sadr felt it's necessary for an academic, uh, academic university education. And if we look back at uh, Iran before the revolution, we find that there was an inherent feud an animosity between these two institutions, between the seminary in Qum and elsewhere and the university. There was some sort of rivalry and jealousy between them. Uh, neither one recognized the other. And the seminary was perceived, the seminary in Qum and elsewhere was perceived by the uh, university people as an old-fashioned, backward, narrow-minded institution, while the university and academic education was perceived by the scholars, the religious scholars, as very secular, very liberal, and sometimes anti-Islamic. So there was some rivalry between them, and it was very strange for a religious scholar who is trained in the seminary to go and venture and go to study in a university. But this is exactly what Sayyid Musa Sadr did. He felt it's necessary for an, uh, for an academic university education. Perhaps he knew that with a broader understanding on secular life and its form of education and policies, it could play an integral part towards his future. He was a visionary and open-minded man who not only lived in the present, but also sought out the future. He, re he realized that the cocoon of religiosity was not sufficient. Extended relations with the interfaith communities, policymakers, and social entities 
were critical in order to lever some weight. Such a move did not settle well with the circle of traditional clerics in Qom. Nevertheless, such a move was expected of Sayyid Musa Sadr. After all, he was one of the few students in the seminary of Qom who took interest of political and worldly news at reading the daily newspapers and inquiries. Thus, he moved to Tehran and received a degree in Islamic studies and philosophy from Tehran University in 1956. After completing his academic education, Sayyid Musa Sadr moved to the city of An Najaf al Ashraf in southern Iraq in 1954, and he was there until 1958 to further his Islamic studies. Uh, in Islamic theology, jurisprudence, and philosophy, under the, uh, the, under the teaching guidance of Ayatollah Sayyid Muhsin al Hakim and Ayatollah Sayyid Abu al Qasim al Khoi, and many others. And of course, when he was in Qom, he studied under uh, many well known leaders at that time. One of them is Sayyid Muhammad Hussein al Tabatabai, uh, 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 Sheikh Murtad al Mutahari and Sayyid Shari'at Madari, the late Sayyid Shari'at Madari, and his older brother, which I had the honor of attending his lessons when I was in Qom, Sayyid Rida Sadr. He became a very young cleric to reach the classification of Ishtihad. He was highly intelligent and a serious student, often challenging his superiors. One of his mentors, I was reading the biography of uh, Sayyid Musa Sadr and I came across this interesting story. One of his mentors in Qom nearly gave up on his inquisitive questions, saying that he needed to prepare even further to provide him with logical answers. In the city of Najaf, Sayyid Musa Sadr, he mastered the field of Islamic philosophy and previously wrote extensively on Islamic economic theories. The contemporary Sayyid Hussein Nasr said, his great political influence and fame was enough for people not to consider his philosophical attitude. Although he was well-trained follower of long-living intellectual tradition of Islamic philosophy. After completing his studies, Sayyid Musa Sadr began to teach. He was very popular amongst the students and, and they flocked to his classes. Now we move to his journey to Lebanon. And I have an account, interesting account, very brief about the situation of the Shia people in Lebanon before the arrival of Imam Musa Sadr. One Lebanese Shia woman who lives uh, in my neighborhood in Los Angeles uh, from south of Lebanon describes her childhood memories in 1950s. She says, <clears throat> we were a family of six children. My parents tilled the land growing tobacco leaves and our yearly, as our yearly income. We lived in a two-room mud mortar home that my parents built together. One room housed one donkey, a few sheep, goats, and chicken. What a beautiful life. I'd love to have such thing, you know, in my house. But I have many kids instead, so. <laughs> <clears throat> While the family lived in the adjacent room, the bathroom was outside behind in the shrubbery. We lived off vegetables we grew yearly, mainly onions, radishes, herbs, cucumbers, olive, and fruit trees. Often we would exchange one type of food for another from neighbors. If we were lucky, we got to eat an egg once a month, once a month. Most of the time, the eggs would be sold at the market. The meat was only eaten on Eid days, mostly Eid al the sacrifice, Eid al-Adha. Since I was the smallest, I got the handy-me-downs with the numerous patches sewn on the one pant, shirt, and a dress. No other child in our village had shoes or a heavy sweater. I got lucky my oldest sister who was living in America provided them. We had no electricity, running water, or paved roads. Daily, we would walk three miles to fetch fresh water, hand wash our clothes and dishes, and bathe from a well. Like every other parent in the village, our parents would not allow us to go to school, although the nearest school was five miles away. First, 
They could not afford the, tui the, the tuition. And second, they needed all the hands in the field to survive. With such circumstances, Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr arrived in Lebanon in 1955. This was his first visit, brief visit. And he was stunned by the plight of the Lebanese Shia, mainly concentrated in the rural south and Bekaa Valley. The Shia were the most impoverished, illiterate, and underdeveloped people of Lebanon. That was back in the 50s, but now they are the most handsome, attractive, <laughs> and wealthy people, not only in Lebanon, but in the whole world. And you can see some of them here with, with us today. They were ragged wanderers with many children and could often be seen begging. Many had begun to flood the eastern suburb and southern slums of Beirut in search of work. At that time, at the time, Lebanon was experiencing a boom in industrialization and development, and the Shias became the cheapest hired hand, accounting for 75% of the industrial work, work, workforce. It was in Beirut that impoverished Shia in contact with the affluent city dwellers experienced the unbalanced scale of social and political dividends. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr left Lebanon and returned to Qom, but he never forgot about the humiliated Shias of Lebanon. It haunted him how they seemed defeated and content with their situation. Unlike their history as people who fought oppression and stood on the grounds of principles and justice, during his brief stay in Lebanon, Sayyid Abdul Hussein Sharaf al-Din, who is related to uh, the Sadr family, and who used to live in the city of Tyre in, in, in Lebanon, in southern Lebanon, and who passed away, I believe, in the late 50s. Sayyid Abdul Hussein Sharaf al-Din, at that time, was probably the most distinguished uh, religious Shia of the Lebanese at that time. When Sayyid Musa was in, 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 in Sur, Sayyid Abdul Hussein expressed his desire for Imam Musa to play a major role in Tyre, Lebanon. His colleagues in Qom persuaded him not to take the offer. He retorted, I have a moral and religious duty to go to Lebanon because it is in need of leadership. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr wanted to awaken the conscience of the Shia in Lebanon. After the passing of Sayyid Sharaf al-Din, one of his sons, and I think it was Sayyid Jafar, if I am not mistaken, executed his father's will by requesting Imam Musa Sadr to move to Lebanon. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr became enthralled about, about the Shia cause in Lebanon. He felt Lebanon was a, capable of absorbing a revival. In fact, it was an open and pluralistic society unlike other Arab states. The Lebanese Shia easily embraced Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr because of his family's scholarly lineage, his ties as a Lebanese, remember he was in Lebanon several hundred years ago, his forefathers, and his towering religious knowledge and foresight. Thus, his sole focus was on the Mahrumin, the disinherited Shias, and built their struggle on this platform. He had no interest in egoism or leadership. His sole purpose was to help the impoverished Shia. He began to awaken the Shia through the member, the pulpit. Despite his Persian accent, his charismatic lectures were piercing arrows that penetrated the hearts. Unlike other Lebanese Shia clerics, who retired to flat rituals and emotional sermons, he challenged the social and political stagnation of the Shia. His sermons spoke of reason and relevance and overflowed in substance. He was straight to the point without any obscurity or hesitation. His weapons become his words and his lexes epitomize the struggle and martyrdom of the grandson of Holy Prophet Muhammad, Imam Hussein. In one of his speeches he said, Whenever the poor involve themselves in a social revolution, it is, it is a confirmation that injustice is not predestined. This resonated within the Shia Lebanese, and they began to look at Sayyid Musa Sadr as the imam and savior of their plight. 
And let me tell you something. That the term Imam was not very popular among the Shia tradition until Imam Sadr arrived in Lebanon. And I think he was the very first person, very first Shia leader to assume the title of Imam. And from there, of course, this title spread that even someone like me, now he has this title Imam. So now it is the, the market has all, you know, overflown with, with this title. But he was the first one to assume this, this title. So they referred to him in Lebanon as the Imam. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr has a capturing aura. His speaking ability was eloquent. With sincerity, he reached out to all sects with a patriotic message of Lebanon being one, and he preached a pluralistic and inclusiveness. And for this, all Lebanese relished him. He was insightful. The Shias flocked to him. The Sunnis embraced him at their mosques. And the Christians welcomed him to preach in their churches. He knew his audience well, and with the clarity, he catered to the level of the peasant or affluent, the politician or academic, the clergy or layman. They all became captivated by his enigmatic vision. Fuad Ajami writes, quote, one would sit at his feet looking to reap the teachings of the master, only to leave with more questions than one had brought him, end of quote. He crossed religious and sectarian lines by also connecting with the Druze and the Armenians. He spoke of pluralism and often iterated to the Beirut crowds that the Quran instructs Muslims to work and strive together, and that Christ catered to the impoverished and destitute. In 1962, the year that I was born, Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr engaged in interfaith and intrafaith dialogue. He often visited other delegates, state ministers, ambassadors, and he numerously utilized the Beirut press. In 1971, he formed an outreach committee, which included Southern Christian and Muslim religion, religious leaders to follow up on social political activities. One of his main priorities was to clean house within the Shia of Lebanon. <clears throat> by overriding the need to use the chief, the Za'ims. The chiefs were the elite Shia families, such as Kamil al-Asad was one of them, the powerful Shia political boss from the southern town of Taiba, who often run the show in the south. He and other chiefs came to power by subordination and patronage. Peasants of south would pay allegiance to them in exchange for mediocre services. Even the Shia clerics relied on them. The chiefs were often too greedy. They worked their politics to empower and enrich themselves and cared less that their constituents remained deprived and hopeless. When Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr took to the post of the Shia council, it placed, home, it placed him on an equal, if not better, footing than the chiefs. Since the chiefs were self-serving their interests, and Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr had, had no dependence on them. He bypassed them and took the Shia cause directly to the forefront of the political arena powerhouses, the Christians and the Sunnis. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr first began spinning the reform wheel by making immediate and practical solutions for the Shia. He built several social organizations and founded economical avenues by establishing the first center for the orphan and deprived Shia children, a senior home, vocational schools, text mill, and founded the House of the Gur development. These were not to be the end, but the beginning of the Shia solution in Lebanon. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr began to make social and political requests on behalf of the Shia from the platform of the Supreme Islamic Shia Council, Al Majlis al Islami Shia al A'la. He demanded funds from the government to build the schools and hospitals in the south. He insisted on the government to resolve the social, political, and economical quarters of the Shia and to increase senior positions in the government. This led to the formation of the movement of the disinherited, Harakatul Mahrumin, which pursued for better economic and social conditions for the Shia in 1971. Since the stronghold of the government lay 
primarily within the Maronite Christians and the Sunnis, his demands continued to be ignored. After continuous neglect by the government, Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr on March 18, 1974, called on the industrial Shia workers, which accounted for 70% of the workforce, to protest in a demonstration, and over 50,000 working Shia took to the streets of Beirut, and their numbers were alarming. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr was unique in every sense of the word. When he first arrived in Lebanon, he became heart-stricken heart by the placid social and political posture of the Shia. Never in the history of the Lebanese Shia did they witness a person who genuinely cared about their dire situation like Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr. With a bloodline reaching back 800 years, he was a master of Islamic theology and a family prestige, aspirations, knowledge, and visibility were modeled, molded by the upbringing of his honorable father, Ayatollah Sayyid Sadruddin al-Sadr. Although unbalanced, Lebanon held a richness in the multiplicity of its people. Lebanon is raised on diversity and seeded with potential change. Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr broke sectarian lines through his charismatic stature, openness, and provocative capturing speeches which opened avenues for him to begin his reformation. Through practical innovation and political representation, he began to reform and advance the Lebanese Shia. The Lebanese Shia. Success could be seen on the horizon, but an ominescent cloud forsook the chance by his disappearance. Still, until today, Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr continues to be a living legend in Lebanon. Unfortunately, his cause ended when he, and I hope it would not end with his having his honorable sons with us and his honorable sister working very hard in Lebanon, Umrah et Sitrabab. I think that his cause will continue. When he and he, his two companions paid a visit to Libya on August 31st, 1978, to meet with officials from the Qaddafi government, never to hear from again. It is said that Imam Sayyid Musa Sadr was becoming too influential, not only in Lebanon, but also in other Arab nations. His vision for the Shia was embarking on the homogeneous Sunni states. He had the potential to move the Shia forward and a progress outside Lebanon, and that was deemed as a threat. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about the identity of Sayyid Musa Sad because so many people over the course of the past 12 years that I've been involved in research on Lebanon have asked me the question of who was Musa Sad? Who was he really? Was he Iranian? Was he Lebanese? And then when I would respond um, by saying that defining his identity was really related to the interpretation of a number of social political events, mm -hmm and that depending on one's political stance, what one could argue either way, I always noticed this sort of clear sign of disappointment that suggested I hadn't done my homework really well enough to find out the truth. And just as I did not have any information about his whereabouts and whether he was still alive or not. So this paper attempts to give a sort of more detailed response to the question of Sad's identity and contextualize the, 19, um, the time from 1959 to the present, actually. I take terminologies such as spy, Iranian, Lebanese, agent, authentic, as categories of practice. That is, as discourses that do two things, that people engage in in order to make sense of themselves and of others, and second, as, as discursive strategies to maintain power. So here I'm concerned with the analytical dimension of these terms. That is, I want to ask, who says Musa Sad was Iranian and why? Who says he was Lebanese and to what ends? And who considered him a spy? And again, what did they gain from using such labels against Sad? So as this paper hopefully shows, categorization of people along national lines is a far more complex story than trying to find out their legal citizenship and types of passport. 
visions of Musasad identity have shifted in certain sociopolitical contexts, some of which I will discuss in this paper. For example, after the success of the revolution, the ruling elite in Iran declared Saad as Lebanese. In recent years, however, it seeks to highlight his transnational background to strengthen his own position in Lebanon. But more to this later. The talk is actually divided in three sections. In the first section, uh, I focus on the local Lebanese context from 1959 to 78. And there I look at two trends. One of them I call the Lebanonization of Mossad. The second one, the Iranization of Mossad. In the second part, then, I briefly explain the transnational Shiite context from 1970 to 79 in order to situate post-revolutionary debates about Saad's identity. And then in the third section, um, I lay out why he was labeled Lebanese, Iranian, or a Shiite transnational after his disappearance, of course. I suggest that the figure of Musa Saad has become a paradigm through which Lebanese and also other Shiites have conceived the place of Lebanese Shiites in a wider Shiite world in divergent ways. By referring to debates over his identity as a paradigm, I mean that the memory of Saad involves not only a core narrative, but also ritual and mythical elements. And by mythical, I mean in an anthropological sense that is removed from particular time and space, that it has become abstract, basically. And it, one can draw on that uh, paradigm to generate multiple and sometimes opposed accounts of Shiite, Lebanese Shiites within a Lebanese nation and Lebanese Shiites' relations to other Shiites um, elsewhere in the world, but above all, in, to Iran. For example, over the years, in that Lebanese paradigm, Saad's identity has shifted from being portrayed as anti-Palestinian to being the leader of the resistance, from being an Iranian spy to a Lebanese national figure whose trademark was coexistence. And this shift stands in a clear dialogic relation with Lebanese Shiites national and international politics. There is no doubt about that. Also, commemorations of his disappearance, just like Ashura commemoration, serves us, serve us as texts to which we can tell much about various dimensions of Lebanese Shiite identity politics from that time. OK, so let me move to part one, Lebanon 1959, 1978, the Lebanonization of Mossad. There were principally, and we have heard that a lot uh, in the past two talks, three groups within the Shiite community who opposed Mossad's activism and saw their own positions and power threatened by him. Those were the Shiite leftists, the feudal lords, and some prominent religious family and religious scholars. One way of resisting Saad's popularity was to refuse his claims to be an authentic Lebanese. To many of Saad's opponents, Saad was born in Rome, he held an Iranian passport, and he spoke Arabic with a Persian accent. And these were reasons enough to label Saad an Iranian in order to marginalize him politically. To his followers in Lebanon, who agreed with Saad's activism, he was clearly a Lebanese. To Amal member, his speeches given in Arabic with a Persian accent were simply part of his charm and char charisma. And the memory of that accent brings smiles to their faces and prompts the telling of sympathetic anecdotes. Saad's accent was for them a merely historical co coincidence without deeper implications, which led this Amali to speak Arabic with a Persian accent even though the same accent, of course, later became a reason to deny current Iranian claims to piety. At any rate, supporters as well as opponents of Saad engage in a discourse of origins to decide his identity. Some trace his genealogy back as far as to the 19th century in order to include him in the Lebanese context. Others took his birthplace as a starting point to exclude him from Lebanese political life. But Saad, who actively positioned himself in the Lebanese national context, and in particular in South Lebanon, traces genealogy back to Jabal Amen. And he contributed to that particular uh, narrative confirming his Lebanese identity. For example, in 1961, two years after his arrival, using his Persian accented Arabic, he says, so the interviewer asks him, I know your origins are Lebanese, men ask Lubnani. When did your family immigrate and why? Saad responds, my origins can be traced back to Sayyid Saleh Sharaf al-Din, who immigrated with his son Saad al-Din to Iraq 150 years ago as a result of the well-known attacks of Al-Jazar. Ever since, a large family section, which took the name Sadr, has lived in Iran and Iraq. 
by 1966, when his activities in Lebanon to bring the South to the attention of Lebanese state had, so, had slowly taken off, and the need to clarify his identity uh, towards the Shiite food allures in the South, and the larger public became more urgent, Saad changed his position slightly to the question, is it right what some say that you're a descendant of a Persian family? He responded, I'm from a Lebanese religious family who used to live in the South. My grandfather, Sayyid Saleh, had immigrated from the village of Ma'raka in the vicinity of Sur during the Turkish period. We used to live in Iraq, where my grandfather established a family known as Beit al-Sadr. Then his son, Sayyid Sadruddin, traveled to Iran to visit the tomb of Imam Riza. When passing through Isfahan, his relatives urged him to stay due to the custom of respecting Lebanese Amali ulama. So he stayed and established a large family. Both families in Iran and Iraq have kept their title of Amalin, al -Amalin. Here we see a shift in Saad's interpretation of his identity. The emphasis on trading, tracing his genealogy to the south and Jabal Amal becomes more central, as does the emphasis on how the Saad family in the so-called Iranian diaspora kept the, the title of Amali and implicitly the heritage. Now to the Iranization of Musa Saad. So among those who resisted Saad's political activism were many religious scholars, some of them from the well-known ulama families from the south. And I will focus on one such family, the well-known Al-Amins. And let me say that the most vocal, maybe, opponent of Saad was Sayyid, Sayyid Jabad Mughniya, who was a poor senior Shia scholar from South Lebanon, who thought that he deserved to serve as the Imam of Sur instead of the junior Saad, who eventually occupied, actually, that position, as we know. As a response to this, Mughniya even wrote a booklet against Saad calling him the turban spy, al Jasus and Mu'ammam, but the polemic never got published and I've not had access to it. Sayyid Fadlallah is another example, and uh, Sayyid Hanifa is another one, but now they have changed their positions and claim to be part um, of the Sayyid Musa Saad, but that's another story. So the prominent religious scholar Mohsan al-Amin was known for his concept of taqrib, that is Sunni Shiite rapprochement and solidarity. In this context, he was, for example, active in debates over the proper modes of performing and interpreting the Battle of Karbala, as he saw some public Shiite activism as creating divisions among the Muslims, and of course, as re reinforcing the image of Shiites as backward and anti-modern. I conducted two lengthy interviews with his son, Hassan al-Amin, in August 2000, shortly prior to his death. The ideas of Hassan al-Amin reflects what many Lebanese Shiite religious scholars opposed to Saad thought of Saad's activism back then. To Hassan al-Amin, Saad was an agent of the Shah who wanted to create divisions among Lebanese Muslims and ally the Shiites with Maronites to weaken the position of the Sunnis and ultimately that of Nasser in the region. The group was strongly opposed to the idea of creating the Supreme Islamic Shiite Council and separating Shiites' affairs from Dar al-Fatwa, the Sunni Dar al-Fatwa. To Hassan al-Amin, the creation of the council was a turning point in the relations between Sunnis and Shiites. For example, for two years prior to 1967, when the council was created, Dar al-Fatwa had begun commemorating Ashura as a way to attract Shiites, attract them away from Musa Saj, but then immediately stopped um, organizing such commemorations after 67. So according to Hassan al-Amin, I'm quoting, the most important reason for Saad to come to Lebanon was to create divisions among Sunnis and Shiites. At the time he came to Lebanon, it was customary that the call for prayers, the Azan, in the official radio was said in a Sunni tradition. Saad complained to the Ministry of Media, Minister of Media, and said that they should play both forms of Azans in the public radio since the Shiites are part of the Lebanese nation and government. The fitna began right there. Sunnis rejected this proposal while many Shiites insisted upon it. It was agreed that in the event, that the, in the evening call for prayers, the phrase Hayya ala khair al amal, which indicates adhering to the Shiite faith, be added while in the early morning calls, the phrase was not to be included. End of quote. He then goes on with his anti sad narrative of explaining how amid this fitna, the word he uses, Musa Sad began to create an alliance with the Maronites and thus began to pray and hold convocations in churches that, in his view, was quoting, naturally a step against the Sunni interest in Lebanon, end of quote. Hassan al-Amin explains in this context the necessity to give Lebanese citizenship to Sadr. 
quoting, Musasad was an Iranian with an Iranian passport. He was the representative of Iranian politics in Lebanon, and his activities were coordinated with the Lebanese Duzian Bureau. Usually, a person needs to be a permanent resident of Lebanon for at least 10 years to apply for citizenship. But those Maronites who saw in Sadr a good ally found a loophole in the citizenship law, which ex excluded this law to apply to religious leaders. However, this law was created during the French mandate to simplify the movement of French Christian religious leaders and missionaries especially. Nonetheless, Saad was able to receive Lebanese citizenship." End of quote. Hassan al-Amin presents Shiite-Sunni power relation as a zero-sum game. Saad's activism, in his view, weakened the so-called Muslim front against the Christian. What Saad's interest in institution building must be, of course, considered in the, political, in the context of political sectarianism and the setup of Lebanese constitution. Engaging in a discourse of taghrib was one way for those anti saad religious elite to maintain their hegemony over the Lebanese Shiite community and to advance their own leadership positions and strengthen their own alliances with the political elite. The religious elite expressed its fear over loss of power in theological discourses. One was taghrib, the other one was calling the creation of the council as a bid'a, innovation, or as a step towards ruining I think, imagine, ruining the autonomy of the ulama as the council would closely work with the state. Saad, however, justified the creation of the council after failed attempts to convince the Sunni Mufti, Sheikh Hassan Khaled, I believe at that time, to alternately preside over the Dar al-Fatwa. The council was meant to be an autonomous institution supervising various Shiite concerns. Saad justifies his creation as following in the footsteps of other religious communities who had created their own bodies in the last, in the 50s and early 60s. So to sum up briefly, one avenue for Saad and his opponents to carry out their power struggles and express their conflicting visions regarding the identity of the Lebanese Shiite community, regarding their, own, their vision of pluralism, Shiite's positions in the Lebanese states and in the larger Arab world, was to engage in a discourse over citizenship and national identity. Deciding whether Saad was Iranian or Lebanese then became intimately related to how each Shiite ethnic entrepreneur imagined its own position in the community and how they envisioned to shape the Lebanese nation. One can then argue that the discourse over citizenship is one aspect of the larger modernity debates in which these two families, the Sharaf al-Din al Amin, engaged in from the 1920s in order to claim leadership of the community. But that's a field that Professor Abisab is an expert in, and we will hear about that. Okay, moving to the second part, the transnational Shiite world from 1970 to 1979. Between 1970 and 1979, Lebanon served as a basis for anti-Shah Iranian activism. Two Islamic opposition movements were connected on varying degrees with Musa Saj. One was the liberation movement of Iran, with Mustafa Chamran as its representative. The other were close associates of Khomeini calling themselves Maktabis. And I've written about that story somewhere else, so I'm not going to elaborate on these networks, neither on their debates, but just making my points. So both groups expressed their opposition to the Shah, so the liberation movement, people, and the Maktabis. They expressed their opposition to the Shah's internal and external politics in discourses over the authenticity of Shiite identity. There were other available discourses, one of them was the Shiite authenticity discourse. The fact that the Shah maintained close economic and political ties to Israel outraged opposition leaders such as Khomeini, who in his speeches condemned the Shah as a fire worshiper. The question of support of the Palestinian cause and degree of Shiite authenticity then became tightly inter interwoven with each other in that milieu. At some level, it was accidental that Lebanon was both a self safe haven for these anti-Shah opposition activists, because it lacked a strong strait, as well as that the Palestinian-Israeli conflict played such a role in the lives of Shiites, especially in the, um, in the South. Simultaneously, as in Iran, the Islamic opposition to the Shah engaged in the Shiite piety discourse, linking it to the Palestinian cause. So my point here is basically that Musa Saad was caught between two debates that at some level overlap, but not always. One was the local Lebanese context where he had to prove what his opponents referred to as his Lebanese component of his identity. And that was only possible if we agreed to their vision of Shiite authenticity and accepted their claims to leadership. The other, you know, otherwise he was labeled as an Iranian spy. 
in that local context, of course, the debate over the support of the Palestinian cause was important too. The second debate he was part of and was drawn into at some times was the one with anti-Shah opposition members, more specifically with the Maktabis. There, his opponents did not engage in a discourse over national identity to show their disagreements with Sadr, but rather extended that Iranian debate on Shiite authenticity and labeled Sadr as an agent of the Shah and therefore an inauthentic Shiite. In a sense, his transnational background was acknowledged or taken for granted, but whether he deserved to lead the Lebanese Shiite community became the pressing question. Here, the Maktabis supported Khomeini's claim to leadership based on his vocal opposition to the Shah and his unconditional support for the Palestinian cause. But of course, Khomeini was sitting in Najaf and Musasad was in South Lebanon. And I mean, Khomeini uh, was not involved and his people were not affected by what was happening in South Lebanon. But, so both these opponents of Saad Labeled Saad as a spy because they saw their own leadership position endangered through Saad's activism and popularity. They disagreed with Saad's Shiite piety and coexistence vision, which they thought supported Maronites' dominance of the country, who were the Maronites, of course, were close to the Shah of Iran. That weakened the Muslim opposition, who received support from the PLO. So Ali Akbar Muhtashami, who became ambassador to Syria in 82, and was believed to be the brain behind creating Hezbollah, claims on one of his visits to Sur that Musasad gave a speech blaming the Palestinian presence in South Lebanon for Israeli military attacks there. Mohtashami reveals how this incident caused him to worry and how he began, quote, to feel the danger for the future of the Palestinians because of what he saw would sour the minds of the people of the South and would create a situation where the Palestinians would not be able to attack Israel from South Lebanon, end of quote. Thus, he decided to meet with Khomeini as soon as, Imam Khomeini, as soon as he returned to Iraq in order to, quote, explain the various dimensions of this matter, end of quote. Muhtashami wanted to leave Lebanon as soon as possible, for in his view, the undesirable political situation in Lebanon was not in accordance with political inclination of people like him, end of quote. In addition, he notes how he disappointed he was in the political line and quote, the so-called non-revolutionary behavior of Mr. Saad. Some of the members of this anti saad group also maintained contact to each other. For example, Hassan al-Amin revealed in our interview that Jalaluddin Farsi, the staunch enemy of Saad, who in post-revolutionary Iran became the spokesman of Fatah in Iran, had come to visit Al-Amin to create and had asked him to create a committee and ask the Iranian Maraje to forward their money to Al-Amin instead of sending them to Saad. Because Saad did not, in their view, invest enough in the Palestinian cause in South Lebanon. The Iranian Maraje had begun gathering money in mosques since 1973 and forwarded this to Musa Saad through his brother Reza. Al-Amin revealed how Javad Mughniye shared this view with Farsi and believed the money of the Iranian marriage was not distributed properly. So we have that network as well. So at one level, therefore, deciding over Saad's national identity in Lebanon between 1959 to 1978 and in post-revolutionary Iran up to the mid-90s was also tightly connected to what these opponents believed was Saad's position towards the Palestinian cause. Now, I'm moving to part three. I know I don't have much time. <laughs> Almost there. Uh, which I called the emergence of a paradigm. Iran from after Saad's disappearance, basically after the success of the revolution to mid-1990s. Shortly after the disappearance of Saad in Libya, the Iranian revolution succeeded. Iran and Amal relations were multi-layered and contradictory between 79 to 82. The Iranian government was fragmented, being composed of those who associated with Amal, as well as those who despised Sadr and Amal. Liberation movement members and Amal continued to have closed ties in on both personal and political levels. Uh, there were lots of movements back and forth. And Amal demonstrated solidarity with Iran, with post-revolutionary Iran on various levels. When I say Iran, I mean post-revolutionary Iranian government. I'm just using the short form. And for example, they hosted Iranians who came to visit, um, showed them around in South Lebanon. They commemorated the death of Iranian leaders. Delegations of Amal members were sent to Iran. There were extraordinary um, amounts of Inform, you know, event news on events in Iran in the media of Amal members. Uh, so despite 
those close ties, there were three problems that darkened the relations between Amal and the Iranian government. One was the Iranian government's lack of interest in finding Saj. The second was the question of sending Iranian volunteers to South Lebanon in 1980, which started right after the um, success of the revolution, and not in 1982, actually, and Amal resistance to becoming subordinate to the concept, to Khomeini's concept of Velayat al -Faqih. Amal delegation and sad family members regularly visited Iran in that period to form networks on all levels up to 82, but the main concerns of these delegations was to gain information about the fa fate of Saj. Uh, they saw in the success of the revolution a key chance to rally international support and to find him. They met with Iranian officials, with Khomeini, and asked about Khomeini's support in finding Musa Saj. But every attempt to gain information about Saad's fate through these channels was unsuccessful. Despite the lip service they paid to the cause, post-revolutionary Iranian leadership lacked interest in Saad's whereabouts for reasons that I already explained above, that there were those tensions, but these were not known to all Amal members. Although liberation movement members can be assumed to have genuinely desired to find Saad, despite publicly distancing themselves from others who maintained open in relations to Gaddafi in Libya, they did not have the power to terminate or even interfere with them. So people like Saad Khalkhali Muntaziri Farsi continued to entertain close ties with Gaddafi, uh, who the Lebanese shares, of course, held responsible for Saad's disappearance. Also Khomeini, as the leader of the Iranian revolution, apparently did not make any use of his powers to find Saad. He did not agree to meet with the Libyan delegation that had come to Iran, but he did not stop his radicals and his entourage from continuing to maintain any ties. So the lack of any serious initiative by religious and political leaders in Iran to find Saj, whom Amal members considered one of the most important Shiite figures in the world, made the members wonder about post-revolutionary Iranian claims to present this revolution as a pan-Islamic and pan-Shiite revolution. So after the success of the revolution and the Maktabi's marginalization of the liberation movement members by 82, and the consequent takeover of close followers of Khomeini of the government, there was silence created about Musa Saad's fate in Iran. By 1982, Hezbollah was created in Lebanon as a rival party to Amal, and Amal claimed Musa Saad as its own leader, while Hezbollah imagined itself to have radically different goals and visions in Lebanon, and no shared genealogy with the so-called past. To deflect responsibility for Saad's fate, and because of differences in the debate that were going on between the Maktabis and Saad followers, the Iranian government did not claim Saad as one of its own leaders, nor as an Iranian. And Amal did not highlight Musa Saad's transnational background, but presented him as deeply rooted in Lebanon with no connections to the then transnational Shiite ties created between Iran and Lebanon. Commemorations of Saad have been held yearly on August 31st in various cities throughout Lebanon. But in Iran, the government did not allow Saad family members to commemorate his disappearance in any official manner, nor to create any organizations bearing his name. The government viewed Saad's family and those associated with them with suspicion and controlled some of their movements. In brief, then, Lebanonization of Musa Saad in this post-revolutionary context had two divergent meanings. For the Iranian elite, it fulfilled the function to present Saad as marginal to the current Shiite movement. For Amal, it meant creating boundaries to the religious elite in Iran and breaking their hegemonic claims in Lebanon. Now I have one more section that I'm talking about, the transnationalization of Musa Saad, Khatami, and beyond. <laughs> The Iranian government became increasingly aware in the mid-90s that in order to play any meaningful role in the Lebanese political scene, it needs to cooperate with Amal, the so-called rapprochement phase between Amal and Hezbollah. So the erstwhile kafirs, the Amal members, thus became indispensable for the future strategic plans of Iran. This change, of course, had begun during the uh, presidency of Rafsanjani, who was actually quite positive towards Musa Saj and his activism in Lebanon in the 1970s, if one reads his autobiography. But that change is usually associated with Khatami, with the election of Khatami in 1997. So local considerations and changes in the political landscape in Iran 
local, local Lebanese considerations, I mean, and changes in the political landscape in Iran resulted in Hezbollah's official adaptation of the person of Musa Saad as part of their own party. Now, one sees how on various occasions and parades, Hezbollah members carry Musa Saad's picture along those of other Hezbollah leaders like Khomeini and Khamenei, Abbas Musavi and Nasrallah. Nasrallah, while not attending the commemorations personally, Saad's commemorations personally, delivers a speech on the commemoration day of Musa Saad's disappearance and addresses him with respect as our absent imam. During the May 2005 parliamentary elections, when Hezbollah and Amal created alliances in the south, Nasrallah justified this, as, this move as follows, quoting, in the south, for example, the alliance between Hezbollah and Amal movement is primarily a political alliance that aims at protecting the resistance to which both parties belong and which has a single imam, namely Sayyid Musa Sadr, end of quote. Certainly, Saad was not, viewed, was not viewed as the father of resistance in 1982 when the Lebanese Sayyid Musa, Abbas Musavi, then a member of the religious seminary in Baalbek, and in 19, he became uh, Hezbollah's general secretary in 1991, had volunteered to take part in one of the Iranian military training camps in, set up in Baalbek, and he described the need to follow the Iranian model of Alayat Fari because in his view, the Lebanese Shiite community lacked an Avir leader who would stand against Israel's ag aggressions in Lebanon. He referred to the animosity between, quote unquote, some Shiite groups in the south and the Palestinians and stated that the believers, the Mu'minun, among the Shiites in the south wanted to cooperate with the Palestinians, but because of the lack of a pious leader, this cooperation fa failed until these believers found their voice in Imam Khomeini. So there are several reasons for the incorporation of Musa Sadr in Hezbollah's political narrative. One, as mentioned, is definitely the rapprochement between Amal and Hezbollah. But more importantly, I believe, the Iranian religious elite began to realize the symbolic importance of Musa Sadr for its own purposes. In a conversation with the Iranian culture attache Sayyid Hashemi, for example, in 2003, he, tells me, he told me, quoting, not every transformation in the Lebanese Shiite community can be traced back to the Iranian revolution. One needs to go back to Musa Sadr. Of course, he was also Iranian, but he was the person who undertook the first steps to change the plight of the Shiites. But the Iranian revolution strengthened that movement immensely, end of quote. But in 2003, this view of Hashemi was not yet reflected in the type of activities the Iranian Cultural Center engaged in. As there was a discrepancy between theory and uh, what he says and the practical activities of the center. The center did not engage in any commemorations of Saad itself or any, organize any conferences or publish any of his book. That was not yet at that level. So to present their ties to Hezbollah as deeply continuous, Iranian culture and political producers first present Musa Saad as an Iranian, and second, as part of a movement whose logical outcome was Hezbollah. But we saw, of course, that the success of the revolution, that after the success of the revolution, the Iranian government and the person of Khomeini did not invest too much thought on Musa Saad's fate. They considered him Lebanese and believed the Lebanese government should undertake official investigations. Since the reopening of Amal's political office in Tehran in 2001, Amal holds yearly modest commemorations of Musa Saad's there. Also, the Saad Foundation has been allowed to open a branch in Tehran, although not as an official foundation, but as an association. Okay, let me conclude. So, in this paper, I suggested that approaching the question of Saad's identity as either Iranian or Lebanese, based on his place of birth, accent, or legal documents, is not a fruitful way of understanding his complex identity. Instead, we need to analyze self-presentation and perception and contextualize these in local and transnational sociopolitical and religious power contests. I argue that there is a dialogic relation between political outlook and views over Saad's identity. To this end, I argue that terminologies such as spy, Iranian, authentic, are part of discursive strategies to maintain power and should not be taken as analytical categories. Both Saad and his Lebanese opponents engage in a discourse of genealogy to carry out their power struggles and enhance their leadership positions among the Shiite community and ultimately enlarge the Lebanese political order. While Saad traces genealogy back to Jabal Amel to authenticate both his credentials as a Shiite leader and 
as, his, as being Lebanese. His opponents took his birthplace and legal citizenship instead of cultural citizenship, for example, to marginalize him politically. Furthermore, his opponents engaged in a discourse of rapprochement, uh, taqrib, to express their resistance to such institution buildings and to his other strategies of shared mobilization. In this discourse, Saad was labeled as an Iranian spy who was interested in creating divisions between Sunnis and Shias at the height of Nasser's Arab nationalism. Thus, for Saad and his opponents, debates over legal citizenship and national identity became one avenue to carry out many of their disagreements over the identity of the Lebanese Shiite community and their own leadership positions. These debates, I suggested, can also be viewed as part of the larger debates over modernity in which some of the well-known Amelie families have been engaged in since the 1920s in order to claim sole leadership positions among the Shiite community. I also situated the debates over Saad's identity in the transnational Shiite world since 1970. There I argued that power struggles between the Maktabis and pro-Saad took the shape of debates over Shiite authenticity rather than that of legal citizenship. His opponents denied Saad's claim to authenticity because of his supposedly lack of supporting the Palestinian cause and instigating Lebanese Shiites against Palestinians in Lebanon, which was not true. He was therefore labeled as a spy of the Shah of Iran, who was an ally of the Maronites and enemies of the PLO. However, this maktabism post-revolutionary Iran readily labeled Saad as Lebanese to deflect responsibility to draw the Iranian government into some international investigation, and to present Saad's activism as marginal to the success of the revolution, whom now these Maktavis claimed was due to their own anti-Shah activism only. However, since the late 90s, the Iranian government capitalizes on Musa Saad's transnational background in order to create a sense of continuous and shared history with Lebanese Shiites. While Hezbollah in the 80s presented itself as radically, radically different from Amal, and claimed Amal leaders to lack awareness because of their so-called lack of commitment to fight for the Palestinian cause, in recent years, often the genealogy of the resistance is traced back to Musa Saad instead of solely to Khomeini and Khomeini. So finally, who was Musa Saad? He was an Iranian Lebanese Shiite religious figure who was actively involved, but at times also drawn into many different debates and who capitalized on his complex identity in order to participate and to shape many currents, but was also drawn into some of these debates precisely because others capitalized on certain aspects of his identity and expected him to participate in those currents. As such, Sat and others were both constantly engaged in defining and redefining Sat's identity until his dis disappearance in 1978. Ever since his disappearance, the cultivation of his memory has also, de has also clearly assumed ritual and mythical elements, as evident in the yearly commemoration of his disappearance and the recurring association of his fate with the occultation of the 12th Imam. Since then, I suggest that debates over Saad's identity can be viewed as a paradigm, a prism through which we can discern much about Lebanese shared identity politics, both in national and transnational contexts. Thank you. Sorry for saying. I want to divide my paper into two. Uh, one which I will talk uh, about the thoughts, uh, the main constructs of uh, Sayyid Musa Sadr. And then I want to talk a little bit about how he, in a one way, initiated a kind of a reform movement. Because in many ways, he was bringing the ulama out of the closets into the streets, as I will try and show. So my paper will be divided into two, and hopefully, was it um, half an hour, right, or 20 minutes? Around that time, OK. Exactly. Exactly, <laughs> all right. The classical Muslim jurists divided the world into two. On the one side was Darul Islam and Darul Harb, as we know, at the bo a board of Islam and the board of uh, uh, Kofr, of war. But uh, <clears throat> Say the uh, Musa Sadr divided the world differently. He divided the world into those who are Musa'adafan and those who are Mustakbiran. In other words, those who are the oppressed and the oppressors. So he divides the world in a very different way, not between Darul Islam and Darul Kufr, but between those who oppress and those who are oppressed. For Musa Sadr, oppression is not a natural state. It's a human construct. 
Because it's a human construct, it has to be opposed. God did not wish people to be oppressed. Oppression is evil precisely because it takes away the freedom that God has given to humanity. And because it takes away that freedom, human beings have to reclaim that freedom from fellow human beings. God, Musa Sadr claims, has promised victory to those who are oppressed. And therefore, Muslims or any other person for that matter cannot agree or accept to be oppressed. As we are aware and as we've heard earlier today, the Shi'is, especially um, around the 1950s and 60s in Lebanon, uh, suffered from a lot of uh, what we may call economic and social political disruption. Sadr stood up above these disruptions and oppressions. For him, at least, he saw the community as a whole, and the community should not accept to be victimized. Sadr looked upon faith as a solution, not as a reason for the oppression. For him, deprivation of the community was not predestined. We often link faith with justice. For Sadr, faith was not only linked with justice, faith, more importantly, was linked with how we deal with injustice. Because if we are indifferent to injustice, then there's a problem with that faith for Sadr. He saw that the Shi'is were at the bottom of the socio-political and economic ladders, even though they were the fastest growing community in his time in Lebanon. As we are aware, he established the Supreme Islamic Shia Council. Uh, he, being a scholar, did not marginalize himself from the community. On the contrary, he led the demonstrations, he led hunger strikes, he participated in sit-in protests. He believed, in many ways, that religion can overcome and must overcome the oppressive conditions that the Shias in Lebanon found themselves in. To quote him, he says, whenever the poor involve themselves in a social revolution, it is a confirmation that injustice is not predestined, unquote. Sadr was also critical of the government because of the way that it treated the Shi'is. He offered the movement of the deprived, Harakat al-Mahrumin, as we are aware, in order to attain the political rights and the economic rights of the dispossessed within the Lebanese polity. For Sadr, there needs to be a revolution. Why? Because revolution is a human phenomenon. Whenever a person revolts or claims his or her rights, then he's a natural phenomenon because this is what God wants a, a people to do, to claim and reclaim their rights. That revolution has to occur both within and outside a person. Revolution is important precisely because it indicates a paradigm shift, a paradigm shift from enslavement to freedom, from oppression to liberation. Just as a person revolts outside, he or she must evolve inside. So there's a revolution and an evolution too. Human beings can change and must change their society. And the key person here for Sadr was the ulama, were the ulama, the scholars. There is a very famous tradition from the Prophet Muhammad called Al Ulama Warathul Anbiya. And in case you've not heard it, there's a, an excellent, brilliant book written um, by an excellent, brilliant professor called Liyak at Takim, um, <laughs> very modest. It's called uh, The Heirs of the Prophet, seriously. Um, the Heirs of the Prophet, Charisma and Religious Authority in Shia Islam, where I discuss this whole tradition of the ulama and their role and how this title came to be applied to the ulama. The title of Warathul Anbiya, The Heirs of the Prophet. For Sadr, the ulama are the heirs of the Prophet, according to this tradition. But what does it mean? Are they merely inheriting the legacy or the pro knowledge of the Prophet? For him, the ulama inherit more than just the knowledge of the Prophet. They actually inherit the role, the function of the Prophet, in the sense that the Prophets try to ameliorate and better the conditions of the masses. Just as there can be no division in Islam between church and state, an alim or a scholar cannot divide his role between that of religious and, so and social. The alim is both a religious and a social figure. That's why a lot of what he did were socially oriented acts. The social responsibility for Sadr outweigh the religious ones many a time. 
To put it differently for Sadr, the alim or the scholar is a link between the texts and the community. He is the, if you like, the bridge. He is the conscious of the community. And therefore he especially bears more responsibility for the direction of that community. He is not just a reader of the text. The alim on the contrary feels the pain and the suffering of the community. He cannot be afford to be isolated. For Sadr also criticized other scholars who sometimes are petty-minded. For him, the scholars have not only to teach and preach, but more importantly, they have to reach the community. It's very easy to teach and preach, but it's more difficult to reach the community. And therefore, he was able to touch the minds and the hearts, not only of the Lebanese, but also of people worldwide. That's why we are here today commemorating and remembering him. The scholar then is responsible for Say, uh, Sayyid Sadr to implement the Quranic vision, the Quranic vision that of establishing a just social order. In many ways, he is uh, implementing what we may call liberation theology. As we are aware, liberation theology comes from the Central Americas, whereby Jesus comes down from the cross to lead the masses to fight against poverty, to fight against oppression. And in this case, the ulama are required to do that. Sadr did not divide the world, as many have done, on geographical boundaries. Rather, he united the world based on ethical precepts. In other words, the world should not be divided between nation states as much as it should be united under ethical precepts of justice and equality, of standing up against oppression. I now turn to the second part of my talk. Uh, in many ways, because of the writings and the acts of Sadr, he impacted or initiated a kind of a reform movement. Because after all, what was uh, Sayyid Sadr trying to tell us? That the ulama have to react to the needs of the times. They cannot be indifferent. And above all, that they should be engaged in some kind of a hermeneutical activity, an activity to reinterpret past texts. And I want to carry on uh, that kind of thought to see how the legacy of uh, Sayyid Sadr is now being imp implemented by other scholars. Now, not all of them will trace their thoughts to him, it is true. But in many ways, as I said, he initiates that kind of movement, not only the social movement, but I would argue even an intellectual movement of the role of the scholars in modern, day, uh, uh, in modern societies. We need to understand that Muslims living in contemporary times are engaged in a kind of a reform movement. And unlike Catholicism, for example, where you have a, an authority, an apostolic authority, authority in Islam is not located on figures as much as it's located in traditions, in texts. And therefore, any kind of reformation or rethinking, reevaluation has to occur within those texts. To quote Muhammad al-Ghazali, the very famous uh, Egyptian scholar, our fiqh, he argues in as sunnah al Nabawiya, our fiqh relies too much on hadith, some of which are patently uh, wrong, he argues. For example, he quotes traditions quoted in some of the most authentic uh, books amongst the uh, Sunnis that most uh, of the inhabitants of uh, hell will be women, or women cannot be leaders. He says the Prophet never said such things, because if he did, then he must have lied to us, God forbid. He says some of the most um, important and successful leaders in our modern times have been women. And he quotes uh, people like Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher. You try writing Margaret Thatcher in Arabic. That's a jihad in itself. In any case, then, <coughs> believe me, it's not easy. Sharia, Islamic law, it has been argued by many scholars, was crafted based on certain tools. And we need to use those tools to recraft or to reevaluate Islamic law. It is important for us to remember, as Sadr would argue, that we need to be pluralistic in our outlook. And being pluralistic also requires us to reevaluate some of the traditional writings of our scholars. It is also important for us to remember that Islamic law did not come about overnight. The angel Gabriel or Jibrail did not come uh, with a diskette to the prophet says, here Islamic law, go and reformat it on your computer. That did not occur. In fact, 
Islamic law was a product of what we may call juristic speculation, which took at least one and a half to maybe two centuries to evolve. Just to give you an example of how Islamic law has been subject to juristic speculations, the speculation of juries. Today, there are four schools within the Sunni, uh, within the Sunni schools. In fact, at one point, there were 10 schools of law within the Ahlus Sunnah. And they differed amongst themselves. There's nothing wrong with those differences, but just goes to, sh to show you how local custom came to play an important role in the formulation of Islamic law. Take the example, for example, of an AWOL hubby, as I call him, a husband who goes AWOL. You know what's AWOL, right? You don't know where the jerk is. He's disappeared from the wife. This is an uh, issue which is discussed in the traditional juridical manual. And I want to show to you that how Islamic law came about with differences based on where you were. Well, the question that is asked is, how long should the wife wait before she can remarry? You don't know where the husband is. You can't even Google him in those days. <laughs> is he disappeared? Is he dead? Is he just mutaying around with somebody else? Has he found another woman? You don't know. How long should he wait? Well, does anybody want to take a guess here? You don't want to know. Anyway, one school, the Hanafi school, says, he doesn't, she doesn't have to wait very long. She only has to wait 120 years. If he doesn't turn up after 120 years, then she can remarry. I don't know about you, but I've not even seen a woman of 120 years, let alone one who is willing and ready to remarry. Um, the um, the Shafi'is, by the way, say, no, she, 120 years is too long. She only waits for 90 years. And if he doesn't turn up after 90 years, and so on. The Malikis are far more reasonable. She said, they say that she has to wait for four years. And there are other examples also. Like uh, Shaheed uh, uh, Sayyid uh, Musa Sadr, other ulama now are claiming that the scholars cannot afford to be isolated from the societies. Rather, they must understand that the fatawa that we talk of, the juridical edicts or opinions, are nothing more than putting the principles, the ethical principles of Islam into effect. When we look at fatwas or fatawas in isolation, they may not sometimes even make sense. They might even contradict each other. But we need to understand that these fatawa are nothing more than an attempt to put the ethical and moral precepts of the Quran into action. Because we are talking of moral and ethical precepts, then we need to understand how those precepts or principles can be applied today. So for example, Ayatollah Muhaqiq Damad states, that Islamic law needs to go under continuous revision based on principles that are enshrined in the usul al-fiqh, that is the principles of deriving Islamic law. Principles like la dharar wa la dirar, there is no harm, no injury in Islam. In other words, if there is an issue which is confronting the Muslim community, then Muslim scholars have a duty to pass a law so that that particular issue is no longer harming or injuring the community, even if that means that they go against a previous law. And there are other principles like maslaha, the, uh, what is in the welfare of the Muslim community. In other words, the, war, the law must be conducive and lead to the welfare, not the harm of the community. That may require Muhaqiq Damat continues, to read our sources, traditional sources, in a different way. If that is required, then so be it. That means also that many of the traditional points of law have to be read in very different ways. Issues like the testimony of women, the question of uh, diya, what is called blood money, or killing an apostate, as I will show. Muhaqiq Damat continues that let us take the example of the maintenance of a woman. The question of the nafaqa, maintenance of a woman, re in reality, is connected to an external reality, not an internal one. In other words, something which depends on the needs of the times. If, he argues, someone had gone to the imam, one of the Shia imams, and asked him, the imam, about maintenance, about a thousand years ago, 1,200 years ago, the imam would have said, well, the nafaqa, that is the expenditure for a woman, is clothes, dwelling, food, and so on. However, now the nafaka has to include not only issues like clothes, dwelling, and uh, food, but also education and a car have to be factored in, because those are essential for a woman these days, believe it or not. 
In, and he argues, these are his views, that the maintenance of a divorced woman must not only include food and shelter, but, and the women will love this, to pay back the wife for all the housework she has done and all the benefit that she had to forego in order to look after the kids. That's a lot, that you can talk of a ripoff huh, of the husband. In other words, even includes transportation and education have to be taken into account because these are essential elements to the woman's upkeep today. Maslaha then has to legislate for a modern society, uh, Muhakkad Damad argues. It is also important and imperative that Muslims must review and revise their law in keeping with the dictates of their changing circumstances. And these reformations or rethinking, reformulations, whatever we may wish to call it, all have occurred and continue to occur in different sectors, by the way. They are not limited to just one or two scholars. Um, I was in Iran a few years ago, and I picked up a book of 15 volumes. It is called Al uh, Ijtihad wa Naqsh Zaman wa Makan Dar Ijtihad. That is the uh, question of time and place in Ijtihad, in rethinking. To give you another example, another Ayatollah, Abu Jnardi, has argued that stoning of the adulterer has lost its intended effects. Why? Because it has led to people mocking and ridiculing Islam. After all, the form of punishment is not important. The punishment, the purpose is, the, pur uh, the purpose of the punishment is what? Corrective behavior. If we need to change the form so that it's more palatable, then so be it, he argues. After all, the image and the reputation of Islam is more important than the form of that punishment. So he argues that even flogging has to be revised because the purpose of the punishment is the correction of the accused, not the demeaning and mocking of the image of Islam. And he even argues, by the way, he states that when the Messiah or the Mahdi will reappear, he will not go around killing non-Muslims. On the contrary, he said, justice cannot be realized through killing people because they do not want to accept a particular uh, view. Mohsin Khadivar, another uh, fresh thinker, says that restrictions in religious liberty and the persecution of non-Muslims contradict the essence of the freedom of conscience in the Quran. There is no doubt, he argues, that the administration of capital punishment for an apostate, or murtad, or forcing infidels to choose between Islam and death has no sanction in Islam and in fact contradicts the verse, the very famous verse in the Quran, <coughs> la ikraha fid din, there is no compulsion in religion. And this kind of rethinking, by the way, there's a new fic which is coming out. I'm coming out with my second book, inshallah, soon, called The She Experience in America. And uh, as I went about researching this, I realized that there's a kind of a new fic, even amongst both Sunni and Shia scholars, which is being discussed, is called Al Fiqh Al Aqaliya, that is, the fic of minorities. After all, Muslims are living in minorities. How does its traditional Islamic jurisprudence apply to those Muslims who, living, who live as a minority? Let's not forget, traditional Islamic law or jurisprudence was formulated in a context where Muslims were the majority. The Muslims lived as a majority, and the law reflected that majority situation. Now Muslims are in a minority. How does that change? And, um, I can't go into details because my time is running short, but there are newer laws that are being uh, enacted and being proposed. Just to give you one example, and this is quite radical, Ayatollah Khamenei uh, was asked about artificial insemination, uh, what is also called aid. Aid is artificial insemination by the donor. In other words, if the sperm is coming not from the husband, but from a complete stranger, can that sperm be inseminated into the woman? And contrary to what we may think, and contrary to most of the other scholars, he says, yes, it can be. It's quite a, a radical uh, fatwa, by the way. Um, another example, some of you may have heard this, but how laws are now being reinterpreted. Ayatollah Sistani was asked about prayers in space. Now, if you are a Muslim astronaut, and God help you if you are, but if you are uh, orbiting around the Earth, now, I don't know whether you know this, but even to keep your feet on the ground uh, while you are orbiting around the Earth is a jihad in itself. But supposing you can, well, how do you pray? Where is Makkah from space? Well, okay, Makkah is somewhere on the Earth, so you pray towards the Earth. 
But I don't know whether you realize this, but if you are up in space, your day lasts for how long? Does anybody know? 90 minutes. Every 90 minutes, you see the sunrise and sunset. Now, if you're going to pray five times every 90 minutes, then you shouldn't even bother going up there. Because by the time you finish, it shall be time to say Maghrib again, Subah again. It's kind of, you know, continuous praying. Well, he was asked in a genuine question, if I go in space, how do I pray? Uh, do I pray five times every 90 minutes? And he says, no, you don't pray five times every 90 minutes. You actually apportion your day based on 24 hours, and then you will space out your prayers accordingly, which makes more sense than, as I said, praying five times every 90 minutes. Um, lastly, uh, there's Ayatollah Sanayi. And as you can see, there's a wide range of Ayatollahs who are coming up with these new fatawas. Um, this actually was based on an interview I had with him in 2004. And if you want to access this interview, it is available on my website. I've just got a new website. It's called altakim.com. My initial L, which is for London, or Liaquat, and T-A-K-I-M, altakim.com. And in this, uh, this reflects some of our conversations. It's not the full interview. But I'll just quote a little bit of you, uh, for you, just to show you the new kind of thinking that's uh, um, going on with your permission, Mr. Chair. And this will be the last part. The question that I asked was, are the good deeds of non-Muslims accepted by God? In other words, is there such a thing as religious pluralism? Will non-Muslims be rewarded with heaven? And I should tell you very clearly that there is a revolution in Iran going on, as far as I can tell an intellectual revolution. I call it a silent revolution. Therefore, when I presented the views of Ayatollah Sanayi to other Ayatollahs, they told me, inna uh, It means he's an unbaked Ayatollah. Ayatollahs are baked or unbaked, or some of them are nisf baked, you know, half baked. Um, so <laughs> this, I'm just telling you what I was told. In any case, then, what is of the, uh, your are your views? And he says, according to him, I am of the opinion that the outcome of good deeds and eschewing evils according to one's understanding will be paradise. Regardless of the religion they practice, owing to the fact that they are convinced by the righteousness of their ideology, without the slightest doubt, they get what they deserve. God says good deeds will be rewarded 10 times as much as they deserve, and evildoers will be given punishment which fits the evil you will not be unfairly treated. In some Quranic verses, Ayatollah Sane continues, faith is a vital prerequisite for paradise, which I interpret, he says, as sincere belief in the goodness of one's deeds, not necessarily in the belief of God. Strong belief is associated with the mental serenity, and it contributes to spiritual development. However, and then he continues, sorry. Neither identification nor label that is being Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist is a requirement for paradise. Indeed, good deeds are. An agnostic involved in his skepticism cannot believe in God or prophet, and so on. And he continues, the Quran reassures us that God will not be unfair to any of his creatures. And then also I asked him about women's testimony, and again he says very clearly that uh, women's testimony, one woman's testimony is sufficient today, not two. Uh, and that's because the Quranic verse on that in chapter 2, verse 282, was for a particular context. To sum up then, Muslims need to go beyond the classical formulation. Furthermore, I argue that Muslims need to articulate a legal theory which will incorporate issues like dignity, freedom of conscience, and minority and gender equality. Thank you very much. When we look at modernity and usul al-fiqh, we really start with uh, Murtaza and Sari. I mean, when we look at al-makasib, and then we look later, of course, at the monumental work of um, Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr, Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr. We are really looking at um, the transformation of usul al-fiqh in a fundamental way. You cannot read usul al-fiqh before and after Sayyid Muhammad Baqir al-Sadr the way you, know, you can. I'm not aware that Sayyid Musa Sadr's project was actually to do that kind of a thing. He was more interested in the direct fiqhi you know, questions as a mufti that he can give to the judges in the court. That's much more direct, more practical. And of course, he was you know, a political leader, and so he was very much involved. This is why maybe I think that I, I felt that jurisprudence may not be the way 
we would look at uh, his contribution in that in that field. This is my. my. Yeah, I, I don't think that I was suggesting that jurisprudence was uh, um, the way that we can look at him, or at least that was the only way, because he was more of a political social activist. Um, but what I was trying to say is that uh, his way of reinterpreting, of looking at things, um, in many ways spurred others, although it was not necessarily directly. They do not trace their thoughts to him. Uh, but certainly in modern times, we do find, um, especially in the last 15, 20 years, uh, more of this new aqaliya uh, fiqh coming up, uh, and even um, uh, what we call the mustahdafat literature coming up uh, from um, Najaf, the new laws that are being uh, formulated according to the needs. There are all these different elements that people want to see reconciled in him or reconciled by him or by his actions when in fact he sort of, like most of us, has to negotiate them. Um, and one thing that seems to be left out so far is how um, gender at all fits into Saad's vision of a liberated Shia minority in the context of Lebanon or anywhere else. I mean, does, whether he, how does he approach that issue either in sort of political activism or social activism or any other way. I think uh, Imam Said Musa Sadr was unique and uh, by looking at uh, Shia scholars, whether in Iran or Iraq or Lebanon, of course in Lebanon, uh, Said Musa, uh, his approach to the gender was unique and it was something new in the Shia jurisprudence. Uh, the way he treated women, the way he reached out to them, it was something totally new. I have not seen, through following the tradition of other uh, scholars and reformers, I cannot find uh, a match to Sayyid Musa Sadr. For instance, you know that in the, uh, specifically in the Shia tradition, physical contact with the opposite gender is forbidden, even shaking hand. But of course, with the permission of his two sons, I would mention this, that he would sometimes in certain occasions, especially when he goes to a church, when he addresses uh, a new audience, he would not mind shaking hand with women because he put the welfare of the community first. And this is what some of us, we do here, following his example, I myself, uh, working in Los Angeles in, in a very cosmopolitan uh, area. We have uh, interfaith relations. Uh, we deal mostly with non-Muslims. I encounter such examples that I have sometimes. I'm cornered and I have to shake hand with women. So I remember what Imam Musa Sad did in Lebanon. God bless him. And uh, I think I put the interest of religion first, you know. Uh, and uh, he did, I think. Uh, okay, there are different opinions. How do you think a younger Shia generation, my second question is, um, do they think that uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah is a continuity of him? I think the younger Shia generation, most of them, they, they uh, because they had no contact with Sayyid Musa Sadr. For them, he is a legend, but uh, only from stories from their parents, because most of them, the Imam has disappeared 30 years ago. And the younger generation had no experience dealing with him. But he still lives as a legend in Lebanon. Uh, his nobility, his dedication to Lebanon, to the Lebanese cause was unique. Probably Sayyid Hassan uh, Nasrallah, maybe he has a, the same character but maybe he's following a different path there. Uh, I don't think Imam Musa Sadr believed in uh, military means as a solution to the crisis of the Shia in Lebanon. Although he always thought of empowering them through all the means available, but he did not focus on the military means. Maybe Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah is a new figure in Lebanon, but I don't know whether he is accepted by all Lebanese. I really don't have, I cannot verify this now. I wanted to know if you have studied or if you have any uh, insight about how the identity of 
she has in America, especially the youth, how it's changed. Um, I get the sense that it's become more of a cultural thing uh, recently, but has been shifting. And do you see that same change in terms of identifying more with and trying to learn more about Musa Sadr and other uh, Shia political religious scholars because people are trying to, to identify more with their Shia roots and a religious level, not just a cultural level. Because I've heard so many stories, even from my parents, about how when they were younger growing up in Lebanon, they didn't know what the difference between a Shia and, and a Sunni was. And why has this change occurred? And we've learned a little bit about that today. But here in America, what does that mean for the youth and how has that changed? The Imam says this is my specialty, which is his way of saying, you know, you go ahead first. Um, I think you, you are right. The uh, identity is changing of the Shias, uh, especially the youth, and especially in America. Because uh, in different ways, to start with, the immigrants who came here whether, from whatever, whether Lebanon or even, in my case, Tanzania, they brought their understanding of Islam, Shia Islam in particular. And the problem with immigrant Islam is that it universalizes the particular. Whatever is particular, they, they think is universal. Whatever is alien to immigrant Islam becomes alien to Islam itself. And the youths are going beyond that. First of all, they are engaged in what we may call deculturalizing Islam. Uh, that is uh, to make Islam different from culture or the parents' culture. They also are engaged in what I call post-ethnicity. In other words, they don't believe in the ethnic divisions the way that their parents do. So they're going beyond the post-ethnic identity to create what we may call an American identity, a clear Shia American identity. But there's also been sectarianism in the past 15, 20 years, especially after the rise of the Wahhabi movement in America. And what that has done is to generate a lot of t sectarian tension here. Um, especially since the American invasion of Iraq, and again, I deal with this in my book. But what I think, uh, what we uh, see now is a kind of a clear delineation uh, amongst the youth between what they were and who they are now, and a clear chartering out of a differentiation between what we may call our Islam and the Islam. The Islam is Sunnati and the Islam is Haqiqi, as they call it. Um, so there are uh, different modes of identification that the youth are chartering out. And because of that, I think that even the parents are forced now to follow a different course. Globalization has created many different changes. One of these is to define our boundaries as to who we are and who we are not. Uh, and it's uh, rather ironic that in many times, de-ethnicization is occurring in the same places which ethnicize the youth in the first place namely the mosques, because now we're getting different groups coming together. Uh, and there are different, um, you know, on the internet, uh, in different areas too. Uh, it's very interesting to listen to the young ladies talking about her parents so from Lebanon, I will assume. They didn't really see differences between Shia and Sunni. I'm not from Lebanon, I'm from Egypt. When I came in, I was 19 years old. I came to the US. I hear all this Shia, Sunni, Shia, Sunni. I actually called my mom in Egypt, say, okay, who am I? So did we really do any justice of polarizing Shia and Sunni in the West or in this case in Lebanon? I'm just, I'm just saddened to keep hearing Shia, Sunni, Shia, Sunni. My parents, their parents in two different countries, they didn't even see a difference. There's no such thing as just being Muslim anymore. You, you have to choose a side. And, 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 and I mean, it has a lot to do with the discussion actually because I mean, you have to define who you are in those terms now. What does that mean? When Islam came to this continent first, maybe 50 years ago, and especially to Dearborn, Michigan, it, it witnessed the first wave of m Muslim immigrants. They did not define themselves as Shias and Sunnis. They would build an Islamic center together. You would see Shias and Sunnis praying together, fasting together. Uh, there were many intermarriages. Sectarianism was not an issue. But with the rise of Saudi Arabia back in the 70s and 80s and with the petrodollars that was poured in this um, Islamic evangelism. Uh, then this 
unfortunately, this dichotomy started. And then you would see that people identify themselves with being Sunnis, others. Most of the Shias were driven out of Sunni institutions. If you follow the journey of Islam in this country, you will find, for instance, my story, personal story. The reason I came to America back in 1994 because the Muslim Shia Muslim community in San Diego approached me. I was visiting America in 1993. They said, we used to worship with our Sunni brothers and sisters in the Central Mosque in San Diego, downtown San Diego, Abu Bakr Mosque. But on the day of Ashura, we decided to commemorate Imam Hussein, and we were approached by the mosque's administration, and we were banned, and they kicked us out. So now we are thinking of building a mosque of our own. And thus, this came the first story of a Shia mosque. We raised money, and I was the first Shia imam in San Diego, thanks to the Sunni you know, activism. So, uh, and I always say that to, the, to the Shia that you have to go to your brother and thank them because you established your own center. This is a typical story here in America. Uh, and this is not because I don't blame all uh, the Sunnis for that. Most of the Sunnis are open-minded, moderate, but I blame Salafism and Wahhabism, as I referred to that in my paper, to Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, so unfortunately, now we are, uh, when you approach now, go and, and read any uh, Muslim magazine. Take, for instance, the, more, the most popular Muslim magazine in America which is called what? Uh, issued by ISNA. Horizon. Horizon. You go to the back page, matrimonial, and you will find always this sentence that I am a male Sunni Muslim, you know, aspiring to marry a Sunni Muslim lady. There is no Muslim alone by itself, either a Shia Muslim or Sunni Muslim. And of course, this is very agonizing for us. We, we don't accept this. But as you said, the second lady, that when it comes down to the practicals, then of course, we have to be either Shia or Sunni. It's like Christianity. We have over one billion Christians. But when it comes to denominations, we have Catholics. We have Protestants. Even within the Protestant tradition, we have thousands of churches that some of them do not recognize their brethren in the same tradition. So when it comes down to the details, the way you pray, we have two different forms of prayers, the way you pray. There are many other issues that we differ, uh, you know, when it comes to them. But people like me, we are always, we are always working to unify the Shia stand and the Shia voice. In fact, next, Sunday, next Saturday in Southern California, we have the third Shia Sunni symposium that I tried to uphold and pursue for the last three years to bring some harmony and some understanding to the Muslim tradition. Um, if I might uh, shift the focus a bit to, um, uh, from Sunni Shia to within Shia, I was wondering if uh, any of the panelists might be able to tell me more about uh, Musa Sanj and to the extent to which she was familiar with, influenced by Ali Shariati. Whether he was, uh, Musa Sad was influenced by Shariati or whether Shariati's thoughts, but I mean, they were, Shariati was part of the liberation movement of Iran and Sad was closely associated with that. But I don't know whether, which one got influenced by the other. My sense is that uh, Musa Sad was influenced by Shariati, but uh, I don't have the dates to see what Shariati had published at the stage where Musa Sad started giving his sermons and talks about um, a reformist sort of Islamic movement. But there were certainly, both of them were against the Maktabis. That's all I know. <laughs> Just one comment. I, I don't think it's right to, to say Imam Sadr was influenced by Ali Shariati. I think it's, it's uh, vice versa. Ali Shariati was influenced by the open-mindedness of people like Imam Musa Sadr. He was fascinated by certain scholars. One of them is Imam Musa Sadr and his father and his tradition. Uh, and Imam Musa Sadr, as I mentioned in my paper, he transcended the sectarian boundaries. In Lebanon, he did not portray himself as only a Shia leader. He was a Lebanese leader. 
He was a leader for the entire Lebanese. He was a leader. He was becoming, at, in, in mid-70s, when I met him with my father in, in Beirut, he was becoming a, a global leader. He started reaching out to Muslims and non-Muslims, not only in Lebanon, but also outside Lebanon's boundaries. But certainly, uh, the idea, for example, one of standing up against oppression, uh, of fighting for the truth, we can see very clearly articulated both uh, in the thoughts of Shariati and in uh, Musa Sadr, that, uh, in, that injustice is a human construct, not predestined. Again, you'll see in both. So certainly, there were a lot of parallels, and it's fascinating. I think it'll be a great um, project, if anybody wants to, uh, um, to go through it, to study how they influence and how their opinions were shared amongst them, but they were co uh, contemporary to each other also, let's not forget. And in many ways, they both suffered the same fate, uh, and they both suffered through oppression. Both of them, until we do not know until today, we do not know how exactly uh, they passed away. The, the Shah's government, at different points, was looking to utilize, thought something useful in what they were saying, um, and made unsuccessful attempts to co-opt whether we're talking about Shariati, or and then Surah Namaz book talks about that quite a bit, or um, sort of late, right before the end of the Pahlavi regime, there is a suggestion and a gesture to try and invite Musa Sadr back um, to Iran. Where they ended relations, I understand, 73 or something like that before. So there is something about the um, economic populism, the sort of uh, uh, social activism inherent in their kind of theology that is a counterpoint to communism that I think was attractive to a lot of people, whether you're talking about the Pahlavi state or you're talking about within the clerical community. I wanted to ask um, the panelist who spoke, uh, who had mentioned Fadlullah, what were his early beliefs or understandings of, of Musa Sadr's movement and his opinion, and, if, um, and when did it change? And um, I guess how did Musa Sadr affect Sayyid Fadlullah and his um, um, political activism and social activism in, in Lebanon? Well, Fadlallah was certain in the 66 when he returned to Lebanon. Uh, he started his own social movements and social institutions in, in Eastern Beirut, in Nap'a. And uh, he was against the idea of est establishing the Islamic Shiite Council. And he was part of the movement that believed, well, argued um, or believed in the concept of taqrib, the rapprochement. And, sorry? Yeah, uh, believed in the idea of rapprochement and thought that, you know, in order to mobilize the Shia, we, there should be other strategies than following the footsteps of other um, other religious communities in terms of institution buildings. But certainly, uh, Fadlallah is constructing uh, an identity of himself and tracing back his genealogy now to Sayyid Musa Sad, because Musa Sad has that image of uh, among non-Muslims and, and among Sunnis, I, I believe, as well, as a man of coexistence. And for Fadlallah, he capitalizes on that. And Hanifas does the same thing. Now they're all men of interfaith dialogue, and they're in forums. And so, uh, and so he sidelines those differences with Sad, which he had. But uh, there, were, there was competition, both of them wanted to attract and uh, the Shiite community and wanted to sort of sort of realize their own form of what they believe was Shiite piety and uh, be the leaders of that community. But Fadullah was certainly, uh, he was not openly, he did not openly discuss those differences like Mughni, uh, Jabhat Mughniya did. He would not condemn Musa Sad, uh, openly, but uh, certainly was against um, that sort of activism. And I was wondering, um, just generally, what the relationship you think is between discourse and reality? Um, because you talk uh, very convincingly about how Musa Saad is used really as a trope and a, as a label mm -hmm. in these different discursive strategies from their own mm -hmm. subjective perspectives, whether Iranians or Lebanese Shia or the Zaims. And in this one case of Amin, for mm -hmm. instance, where he talks about how he's an agent of division amongst uh, mm -hmm. Sunnis and Shia within Lebanon, um, is there, does it create that kind of a reality too, or is it coming out of some kind of um, real? I have looked at the Sabak material that pub, you know, got published after the Iranian Revolution, and um, well, 
we never know whether they got completely published. But there is lots of evidence. Well, that Musa Saad went to the Iranian embassy. There is no discussion about that. But throughout the pages, there is so much frustration of those Iranian embassy people against Saad because he would not give information out about anti-Shah activism that was going on there. He would not. They expected him to give names. They. There was lots of debates going on. So if you look closely, I mean, I think that it was an unjustified, it was a label used against him to marginalize him. I don't think that he was a spy of the Iranians. Yeah. Actually, government. my question wasn't that whether oh. he was an agent for the Iranians, but uh, Al Amin, the son, you said that in an interview that you had, yeah. that one of the typical things that you would hear yeah. from the Shia in Lebanon was that he actually divi he was divisive in the community. Um, uh, mm -hmm. And you think whether that no, I I, I think that um, as I argued that the political that the setup of the Lebanese state is in such a way that the only way you can uh, participate in the Lebanese nation is to have an institution and so he was following the footsteps of others. There was nothing original or not you know about what he was doing. But I really think that the way the Shiite religious scholars and the Zayams were cooperating, cooperating that he, Musa Saad was breaking that uh, monopoly and the way, yeah, that's what. I'd like to know that what is the difference between the uh, liberation theology in Latin America and the progress which was being done in Muslim countries? The, the concept, uh, um, of liberation theology, as I say, was kind of formulated in Central America, the idea that, uh, that religion must play a more active role uh, in the movement of the people, in um, sol solving issues of injustices um, and the oppressed. Um, we see the same kinds of idea, and I'm not suggesting by the way that Musa Sadr necessarily uh, appropriated those ideologies. He certainly was different from other scholars uh, and in that he saw that the role of the scholars is far uh, greater uh, to be more socially and politically active. But I was dry, trying to draw some parallels between the two. I'm not saying that he appropriated that idea. Um, and more and more, I think, especially after the Iranian Revolution, we find that the same kinds of ideas are permeating different groups uh, of uh, the ulama, especially the Shia ulama. Uh, of course, there are those uh, who are against it completely, who feel that the ulama should not be um, uh, directly involved uh, in this. But uh, that's a minority view now. There's more uh, interplay between religion and politics uh, in different Muslim countries, and certainly even uh, the social role of the scholars. We find this to some degree, even uh, someone like Ayatollah Sistani, who, as we know, uh, is apolitical, but certainly he played a major role in brokering uh, peace deals in Iraq, uh, in trying to pacify the Shias, in at least guiding them, rather than uh, confining himself to a particular position. I really think that the idea of accusing Musa Saj um, to create divisions or a fitna, uh, yeah, it was a way of marginalizing him politically because solidarity, that meant a total Sunni hegemony and if, you know, their cooperation of the Sunni leaders with a few Shiite leaders. And um, so uh, as long as uh, we had the Dar al-Fatwa and they accepted that hegemony of the Sunnis and there was no division, but was that really... Um, the situation that you wanted. There seem to be some particularly Shia concepts um, that are easily and frequently abused by Shia Muslims here. And um, one of them is related to the idea of temporary marriage. Um, another one is, I'm not, I can't think of the word for it, uh, but uh, the ability to uh, deny one's faith if one's life is at stake. Takia, yeah, takia, takia. It, it seems that this principle, in, in my experience in the community, has been taken to great, great lengths to the point where um, sometimes people use it as a, uh, as a, a justification for uh, dealing with other with non-Muslims uh, in a way that you don't have to even consider whether you're being fair to them or not because they're not Muslim. And I, I wonder if you could speak to to those two concepts and why 
um, why there seems to be abuse of those concepts or misunderstanding of those concepts in the community and what can be done about it. I wish we have more time to elaborate on these sensitive uh, subjects, but we have a few minutes. I can, you know, summarize my, my points. I definitely concur with you that there is a lot of manipulation and exploitation of religious perceptions, not only within the Shia community, but within the broader Muslim community, in particular the issue of temporary marriage. Temporary marriage was introduced first in Islam as a solution. Nowadays, after 1400 years, I look at it becoming a problem, not a solution, unfortunately, because it has been mishandled and misused by many followers, not only of Shia. Interestingly enough, I receive calls from some Sunni people who are asking me that I want to do muta, you know, temporary marriage because it's something tempting and easy. So I tell him, but you can't do that unless you convert to Shiism, of course, jokingly. You know. <laughs> the other issue, and of course, you know, Mrs. Sablini, that, uh, and I have a, a humble book called Inquiries About Shia Islam, which is available at the Islamic Center in Dearborn. Uh, I discuss the, one of the issues, which is uh, temporary marriage and the rules and regulations of this uh, uh, relationship. It's a very sacred relationship, I believe. It was intended as an emergency solution, not a norm. We do not encourage the youth to take it as a norm, but as an emergency solution, because we believe that family should be based and built on a permanent base, not a, per not a temporary base. Uh, the other issue of taqiyya that you alluded to I also think that this has been mishandled. Taqiyya is used only uh, during the time when one's life is in danger. And of course, it has, uh, it is, this concept is deeply rooted in the Quran. We have it in several passages in the Quran that one of them, Moses, for instance. فَفَرَرْتُ مِنْكُمْ لَمَّا خِفْتُكُمْ I fled Egypt when I feared for my life. And he was hiding his belief until he reached Palestine and then he came back to Egypt. Prophet Muhammad did this in the beginning of Islam because his life was in danger, the life of his companions were, was, were in danger. And he came to his companions and he said to them that when you are tortured by Quraysh, you have the right to disbelieve in God with your mouth but not with your heart. But that is different from what some people misappropriate in this community or other communities. We have to be honest. Islam is based on honesty and forthrightness and with Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And if you read the traditions of the Prophet and especially the Imams of the Shia tradition, you will find there is much emphasis on being honest with all people. We regard them as a human being. I don't look at my neighbors and I treat them according to their set of belief or their doctrines. Uh, I treat them and this is what God says in the Quran. We bestowed honor on the children of Adam, not only on Muslims. So in Islam, Muslims and, Mus and non-Muslims alike, both are respected and we have to respect the way we deal with them, even if they disagree uh, in religion with us. If, if I can add just one point, um, there's a new book written by Ayatollah Sistani, which is um, called A Code of uh, Conduct, or A Code of Muslim Conduct in the West. In other words, telling how Muslims to live in the West. And when you read through that, what comes out very, very clearly is that Muslims are bound to obey the ethical conduct wherever they are. He says, as soon as you sign on your visa form that I apply for a visa to come to the U.S., for example, you are bound by the laws of the land. If you don't like the laws of the land, then leave. But you are bound by that. In other words, there's a very uh, ethical concern. And the question that people ask, Mawlana, is just amazing that they ask, well, can we fiddle with gas meters, for example? Can we lie to insurance agents or forge passports? And they ask such questions. It's amazing. But the uh, issue is very clear. Lying in any form at all is completely prohibited. Taqiyya is only when the life is in danger. And I think that Muslims are far more safe here in America than in many other Muslim countries.